We've been learning about the events of Holy Week between Palm Sunday and Easter. Today we're talking about Friday, the day of darkness. I only want to ask two questions about this. We're going to spend some time on these, though. Uh, who was responsible for the death of Jesus, and what did his death on the cross accomplish? What was the purpose of that? There's, we could probably fill up all the sermons and all the pulpits in all the world from now until Jesus comes back talking about that. Uh, but we'll just look at a couple things here. I'll be reading most of Mark chapter 15 as we begin this today. Um, All scripture is important, but there's none that is more important than this story right here. So Mark chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is, as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you who are going to destroy the temple and build it again in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man 
ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, He said, surely this man was the Son of God. Let's pray. Lord, these words are difficult for us to to hear and to read and to, to see that your Son, the Son of God, Son of Man, would would be put up on the cross to die for our sins. We we confess our sorrow and our humiliation and our guilt for this. Lord, we thank you that that you have used this in a great and wonderful way. Help us to see this, Lord, and help this to to be alive in our hearts as we we hear this today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Who killed Jesus is not quite as easy of an answer as it sounds, because there were many people who were responsible in different ways. And we're going to look at that. Some of the places, some of blame are easy and obvious, and some are not so easy to understand. But we'll see what we can find here. First of all, the Jewish leaders are definitely to blame. They were the ones that that condemned him. They had had a trial the night before. They didn't like Jesus. They never liked Jesus. He was a threat to them. He wasn't following their rules and their laws, their ideas, and he was just so different than they were. They never caught on to who he was. So they took him to Pilate and said, this man is is worthy of death. They themselves had no authority to put anyone to death. They needed Pilate, the Roman governor, to, to, to sentence Jesus. Well, Pilate did have uh, somewhat of a trial. Now, in those days, in this culture here, uh, the way things were set up with the Roman governor was that the Roman governor was, was limited only by a few things. If you were on trial and you were a Roman citizen, there were definitely rules and laws that came down from Rome about how you were to be treated. We see that later in the book of Acts because the Apostle Paul is a Roman citizen and he's kind of put in a different category legally. Jesus, who is not a Roman citizen, was much like everyone else who would come before Pilate, who's not a Roman citizen. Pilate or any Roman governor was free to make whatever decision they wanted to make as long as, basically the rule was, is it good for Rome... That's the first priority. Make a decision that's good for Rome and make a decision that's good for you. That was what Pilate was operating under. So we see at the end the reason, well, in order to please the Jews, in order to please the people. It had nothing to do with Jesus, guilt or innocence. Really, the only question that he asks about Jesus and the charges that are brought against him is, are you really the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, well, yes, it is as you say, it is as they say. But Pilate did not feel threatened by this. He understood that Jesus, this, this king who was standing in front of him, was not trying to replace him as the Roman governor, the Roman government. He understood there was something different about this new king, and this new kingdom. The real threat to Rome was Barabbas and the people like Barabbas who were involved in some sort of terror, some sort of insurrection and murder. Uh, But as it turns out, who is chosen by the people to be released from jail? It's Barabbas. Why would Rome come back with all the imperial power that they had, the Roman armies coming in in 70 AD? Why did they come back to destroy Jerusalem, take it apart, brick by brick, stone by stone, stone, because of people like Barabbas, not people like Jesus. Eventually, the choice that the people made, the choice that the Jewish leaders made, was what destroyed their city. But 
They didn't know that at the time. They, they chose poorly. Well, Pilate offered, who do you want? And the people rejected Jesus. They chose Barabbas. There was a tradition where at Passover time, the people could choose someone to be brought out of jail. In choosing Barabbas, the people saved a murderer and killed an innocent. Barabbas was a man who wanted to get rid of the Romans by murder, bring in a new kingdom by the death of others. Jesus' new kingdom would be brought in by his own death. Very different than Barabbas. Well, we can blame the Jewish leaders or Pilate or the people who rejected him. There were the soldiers who crucified Jesus. Obviously, they were a part of this. In fact, these soldiers, these Roman soldiers, were experts in torture and death, in killing people. They were the ones assigned the task of of this crucifixion. They were the the most physically responsible for for putting their hands on him and, and bringing him through the streets and taking him to Golgotha and putting him on that cross and nailing him there. They were they were the hands-on people there. Now, some people have said, there are many people have said and written things like, Jesus didn't really die. Jesus was unconscious when they took him down from the cross. Jesus was just really sick, or he was in a coma or something like that. That's not a good reading of history. Because the Roman soldiers knew what it like, knew what death looked like. They knew what it felt like when a body was dead. They knew what it smelled like. They knew everything about it. And to say that Jesus wasn't really dead was to say these people didn't know how to do their job. But if they did not make sure that their prisoner was killed, if they were told to kill the prisoner and they didn't kill the prisoner, they could be held they would be held responsible and they could be killed themselves. So their lives were on the line here to make sure that Jesus was really dead like he was supposed to be. So they are very responsible, directly responsible, for Jesus' death. But even though they're the hands-on people, they're the hands-on instrument of, of murder, they're the executioners, Scripture does not blame them after this. If you look in the book of Acts and and the following books in the New Testament, uh, Herod is blamed, Pilate is blamed, the Jewish leaders, the people, Israel is blamed, uh, but the soldiers are never mentioned again. Their, Their blame seems to be the least out of all these. If we can divide blame up, The one who seems to be the most responsible for Jesus' death is the Heavenly Father Himself. The one who seems to be the most responsible for putting Jesus on the cross is the Heavenly Father Himself. That's hard to understand, hard to to get a grip on. But John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And then in 1 John 4.10, it says, This is real love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us first and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. The Heavenly Father, even before creation began, had this plan in place. And love was what drove, was what took, was what put Jesus up on the cross. And those two things, God so loved the world, and this is real love, not that we love God, but He loved us first, they sound similar because they were both written by John, the disciple, John the gospel writer, John the, the pastor and the shepherd. And what he's saying here is that the attitude of love became the action of sacrifice. If no love, no sacrifice. If no sacrifice, then not real love. And in your life, talking about God's love and what God has done for you and sacrificed, if you understood how much God loves you, if you really understood how much God loves you, 
What difference would that make in your life? God loves you. How much does God love you? So much that he sent Jesus to the cross to die in your place. If you could just get 1% of an understanding of how much God loves you and how much you are freed from everything in the past, the burden, the guilt, the sin, the shame, well, I'm jumping ahead here, but if you can understand how much God loves you, it would change your life. If you need one thing to think about and one thing to remember when you struggle, God loves you. God has done the maximum that he could to show you his love. Well, again, going to 1 Peter, it says, He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. He meaning Jesus. Usually we think of the beginning of the Bible story as Genesis 1-1, that if you want to know what happened first, you turn to the beginning and, oh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But there is something before that even, that God chose to send Jesus. God chose that even though there was the fall and sin and rebellion, that God would send Jesus. Not because you loved God first. Long time ago, God decided to love you. And Jesus came here voluntarily. He committed himself. If you read those verses in Mark chapter 10, uh, 32 to 34, it's one of the many places in the Gospels where Jesus tells his disciples, the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem and be killed, buried and resurrected, but be killed. He knew this was going to happen before it happened, before he got to Jerusalem, Even before he was born, he knew this was... Even before creation happened, Jesus knew that he was going to do this, that he would have to do this, and he chose to do this. Hebrews 12, 2 says, He chose to endure the shame of the cross for the joy set before him. All the pain, the humiliation, all the shame, all of that was worth the reward of giving you the opportunity to be God's child. You who were separated, you who were an enemy of God, Jesus laid down his life for you. Jesus had told his disciples, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Jesus loved his enemies. He loved you and everyone. And lastly, why do I say we're God's enemies? Because you and I are responsible for Jesus' death. You and I killed Jesus people here killed Jesus. No one's perfect. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's perfection, God's holiness, all of that. Since every person was born a sinner, every person is responsible for the death of Jesus. Hebrews 9 says, Christ was sacrificed once to take away many sins, the sins of many. You sinned, As a sinner, you deserve, you were born deserving punishment from God for your sin. Jesus took the punishment that is rightly yours on himself. If you believe that, ask God for forgiveness for your sins and you'll be saved. It sounds too easy, too good to be true in some ways, but it was not easy for Jesus. It was difficult for him. But the offer is there. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, as your replacement, as the one who took the punishment for your sins, I encourage you to do that, receive that today. Now, in two weeks, we'll be looking at the resurrection and some of the benefits that are given to us because of the resurrection. But I just want to take a couple minutes to talk about the benefits of the cross. What did the cross accomplish? First of all, And this was especially important in the early days of the church. Now, 2,000 years later, we're much more used to this idea. But the cross brought Israel and the Gentiles together in a way that they had not been together before. At one time, you as a Gentile would have been far away from God, excluded from citizenship 
in Israel. There were ways for you to uh, believe in G- not in Jesus, in, in God, the God of the Old Testament, uh, but it, you would you'd not be a real citizen of Israel just because of your birth. But now those uh, in Christ, those who are far away, have been brought near because of the death of Christ. Ephesians 2 says, He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating himself in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. The important piece for us for this, uh, the important piece of this for us today is that we are one body. And the New Testament says a lot about that, that we are one body. We are one body as a, a local church here, but we are also one body with believers around the world, those, those Coptic Christians who were killed. Those are your brothers and your sisters, your spiritual brothers and your sisters. The folks that Noel and I got to spend some time with in India a couple weeks ago, they're brothers and sisters, and they really, really felt like there was a real connection there in Christ. It wasn't like, oh, you were born in a very different place, and you eat different food and different language, so I can't, there's no way for me to relate to you. We would sit at the table and just, oh, we're, we're in, in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, and he's brought us together, and we are one body together. So the the, the things that they struggle with, we need to pray for them. And I know that the things that we're struggling with, they're praying for us as well. They're going to the Lord on our behalf as well. But, but we need to uh, remember that we are united together across the world. Well, the cross also reconciled creation with God. When we look out the window, and it's not a real sunny day today, but I know it's uh, the holiday weekend. Usually people are outside a little bit more. And we see how beautiful nature is, beautiful creation is. It's not anything like it was originally created to be. And I cannot tell you whether the sky was more blue before the fall or there are people who say, well, the bees didn't have stingers, and the, 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 there were no thorns on the roses, and, and people say that kind of a thing. You're okay. But there was a way that creation was more perfect than it is now. And creation longs to be released from the effects of the fall on itself. And it's through the cross that, that, that things have been reconciled. In Colossians, it says, and I'll, I'll read the message version because it's, it puts it so poetically, all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. Creation itself has been released and, and will be released because of the grace of God. Well, getting down to the much more personal things here. The cross canceled out the, the, the righteous legal demands against you. Every time you sin, Satan and the law have something to accuse you of. In fact, Let's do a little experiment. Take out a piece of paper, take out a pen or a pencil, and write down all your sins, and then give that to the ushers, and we're going to read them off here. Sound like fun? Yeah, for somebody else. Now imagine, take out that imaginary, take out that paper, Take out your pencil and write down all your sins, all of them, all of them that you can remember, every single one of them, and that paper goes up on the cross. And all the guilt for all that sin, all the shame for all that sin is there. Because that's where God put it. 
and God canceled out the sin and the guilt because Jesus died there with it on him. The sin and the guilt that rightly should be on me, that rightly should be on you, is now over there on him. And when your, your memory brings something to you, when the accuser says, there's no way that you could ever be some sort of a spiritual leader. There's no way that, that God is going to listen to your prayers. There's no way that whatever, because of your past, your sin and your guilt is over here. God has put it on the cross. Now, that's not saying, and there's some extended pieces of Scripture that, that, that say this. I'm not saying that because the guilt and the sin, or the shame is on the cross, you're free to go out and do whatever you want. Not saying that. Not at all. That grace is easy in some ways, but it was not cheap for Jesus. It cost him a lot. So don't take advantage of grace. Live in grace and the life that God wants you to live because God has loved you and God has brought you and he's established you and, and we'll get in a couple of weeks we'll get to living in, in grace because of the resurrection. But don't live just however you want because oh I'm forgiven. That's the wrong that's the wrong takeaway from the cross. Sinless because grace was so costly to God. The last one on the list, the cross made fools out of God's enemies. The New Testament, all of Scripture really, shows that God is supreme. But there are other spiritual powers, authorities, that are powerful and have some authority. Uh, and they use power and authority against God, against God's creation. Well, Jesus conquered them forever on the cross. Colossians 2.15 says that he disarmed them, and we read that in our call to worship today. He stripped them and made a public spectacle of them, not just beating them, but triumphing over them by the cross. And the word used here, it talks about defeating an enemy and stripping the armor, stripping the weapons away from them so that they have no power anymore. They're still there, but, but there's no power at all to them. Once and for all, Jesus broke their power. He put them to shame and led them captive in a triumphant train. And the, uh, the picture there, the idea there, is like the Roman generals who would have some great victory some in some faraway land, and they would bring their army back, and they would bring back all the prisoners that they had taken, the kings and the generals from the other armies and all the other people who were now slaves, and they would lead all these prisoners behind them in a triumphant parade through the streets of Rome. And everybody would say, yay, general, general, general. And all the prisoners would be there. Jesus is the general who has triumphed over these enemies. And now he leads them in their shame and humiliation and their brokenness, broken power. So, Sin is forgiven. Evil is conquered. What more is needed? The work of Christ is done. He sits at the right hand of the Father with his enemies defeated before him. Your work, however, is not done. To follow Jesus, you must carry your own cross, Mark says. Jesus says in Mark 8, he called the crowd to him, not just the disciples, but he called the crowd to him and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross, their own cross, and follow me. What in the world did he mean by that? To put it simply, you don't have to physically go to a cross, but you must deny yourself. The old things about you the old desires, the old 
things that you would give attention to before you came to Christ or maybe early in your walk with the Lord, those old things, you need to deny those things and deny yourself from those things. You must live in the grace of God. And again, two weeks from now, we're going to be talking about living in the resurrection power and the resurrection time of life. But Jesus says you must put those things to death and consider yourself dead to those things, that they no longer have power over you. Will they call out to you and say your name and say, hey, remember how much fun it was when we did this? Remember all the great things that when you made these bad choices happen in your life? And it's a lie. It's not that great, really. But you must deny those things. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the cross that that our sin, our guilt, our shame has been dealt with already. And that is a finished act. And that we do not have to listen to those voices any longer, but we can take up our cross and follow you. So Lord, help us to live as people who are um, one blind person who's found the truth talking to another blind person in this world. Help us to be your gracious servants. Help us to, to know your will and to follow your will, to seek your will and seek your voice every moment because of the cross and because he has given us the opportunity to live in a new way and in a new life. Lord, we, we thank you again for your love for us and for the love of Jesus and the love of the Holy Spirit that's in us as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.